Uh, today I'm going to talk specifically about five common mistakes that I see people make when they use hyperelastic material models. Uh, it's a really simple theory, hyperelasticity, but I see all kinds of problems that people do when they work with this theory. It really is not necessary to do that. And I will tell you these five common problems today in, in order to teach you so you don't make these mistakes as well. Mistake number one uh, is really it's about uh, different kinds of hyperelasticity. I like to think of it as there are two types of hyperelastic material models. Can you think of what they are? Uh, it's not good and bad. It's not advanced and simple. There's something quite different in some sense. And what I'm thinking about is either they are I1 based or they are not. So I1 based hyperelastic models, I'm not going to go through what that really means here, but the, the class is I1 based. You can see to your left some of the models that are I1 based, Neohook and Yo, etc. And then you have a number of models that are not I1 based. And it's a huge difference between these two classes of hyperelastic models. Um, the non I1 based material models, they uh, require multiple tests in different loading modes. But the I1 based, you can calibrate using a single loading mode. It's a huge difference in the amount of work that's needed. And I see a lot of people mis misunderstanding this and trying to calibrate a non I1 based material model to only uniaxial data. So that's a, a huge problem. So here's the mistake number one. I'm going to demonstrate that in a little problem here. So this is a window with M calibration. I have uniaxial tension data in blue here. And I already calibrated an Abacus hyperelastic Ogden model to this data. And if I run it once, you'll see the fit is fantastic. It matches this data really well. So clearly this looks very good, but I broke this rule. I used a non I1 based hyperelastic model and only data in one loading mode, not good. And what the problem can be here is if I turn on a compression load case and I just run that too, you'll see that this Ogden model, it's a two-term Ogden model, is extremely asymmetric. In fact, in about 50% compression, um, we see that the engineering stress is about 600 megapascals. So this is a rubber in tension and it becomes as stiff as steel and in compression. And this is one example of what can go wrong when you break this rule about what experimental data do you need to use. So that's the common mistake number one. Don't do that. Mistake number two is calibrating a hyperlast model using too much data. So that's the opposite problem, right? So now uh, what can happen in this case? Well, we, we can demonstrate this in this case as well. So I'm going to switch back to my demonstration here. And uh, I have some experimental data for the rubber in tension, three different loading modes, uniaxial, biaxial, and planar. And I calibrated an ANSYS 8-chain hyperelastic model. I calibrated to all of this at once, and I get an error of about 6.1%. So it's not perfect, but it's reasonably good. Now I'm going to open my other file that I have. And that is when I calibrated the same model, same hyperelastic model, to only the uniaxial data. So if I do that, I calibrate it to this, and then I can turn on, see what happens. Can I still predict the other loading modes? And if I do that, I get an error that's slightly worse than before, 6.3% instead of 6.1%. But the point here is that some of the I1-based hyperelastic models, you don't need more than one test. There is no need to run multiple tests. There is nothing wrong with it, but testing costs money, and money is time. So it's really not necessary, and therefore it's a mistake. And I see a lot of people making this mistake, where they try to um, use all of this data, and they think that's what they need, and it's not necessary. Very common mistake. Mistake number three is calibrating the model using the wrong strain ranges, basically too large of a strain. And that can be a problem. Uh, so let me demonstrate this. I'm going to open a saved file here again. So here is the data um, that we had from before. And I calibrated this to all the data. You see that fits 6.1%. But it, what if you don't really care about strains up to 40% strain? What if you only care about smaller strains? So I have uh, three load cases here that go up to 10% strain. And now we'll see that this material model has an error about 20%. 
And I can recalibrate this if I feel like it. And uh, if I do that, we get the error in a few seconds, less than a second actually, down to 10%. So by having a material model calibrated to large strains, you may sacrifice what you really care. So that's a very common error that I see. Calibrating the hyperdecimal to the wrong range of experimental strains. Don't do it. Think ahead of time and only use the range of strains you're interested in. Common mistake number four. And that's when you don't consider Mullins effect. If you use hyperelasticity, you typically care about rubbers. And rubbers are often experiencing Mullins damage. So let me demonstrate what this is all about. I'm open a saved file here. And so here's some data for a uh, hyperelastic material that I tested. It was tested four times in uniaxial compression. And uh, we'll see that the material softens in each load cycle, but the softening goes away about three or four load cycles. But the difference between the first and the fourth load cycle can be quite large. This is a relatively unfilled uh, chloroprene rubber, so the Mullins effect wasn't that strong. But it still is a relatively large difference between this stress value and that stress value. So if you care about Mullins damage, make sure you test it and quantify it. And if you don't care about it, make sure you, you condition your test specimens so you don't end up having material that is not taking that into account. It's a very common mistake that I see. And finally, mistake number five, and this may be the biggest one, and that is using a hyperlastic model when you really shouldn't. Hyperelasticity is very easy to use, it's very convenient to use. Sometimes it's good, but a lot of times it's not as good as you think. So let me demonstrate that here finally. I'm going to open up my little demonstration. So here's the data for this uh, Mullins effect we just looked at. So if I take away the first three cycles, and this is cycle number four, and I calibrate a hyperlastic mall to the data in cycle number four, and it doesn't look so bad. Error about 6%. It's not all that bad, right? But if I had run my experiments and I recorded the stress during both loading and unloading, you'll see this. Loading goes this way and unloading goes that way. The unloading is quite different than the loading. So uh, this is how rubbers typically behave. So when you use a hyperelastic material model, you got to be really aware of this, that most materials, when you consider using hyperelasticity, are not actually nonlinear elastic in the response. They're viscoelastic. And if you pick a hyperelastic model, you miss all the viscoelastic behaviors that the real material will have. And that's a very common problem that I see as well. So let's summarize. Um, there are the five common mistakes that I see. Uh, you should be very careful about number one here, particularly that if you calibrate them all and you don't have enough experimental data, you can get very poor predictions and you can run into all kinds of problems. I see this over and over again. That's a huge problem. And finally, the last one is also a number five that I just talked about. It's a huge problem when you use hyperelasticity when it's not appropriate. Um, but if you follow these rules, I think you will find that, that hyperelasticity can be useful. And uh, uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thanks.